speeches uh, of the bill at Shannon last month. And having heard the very positive contributions from all sides of the House, I fully believe that Minister Shatter's optimism in this regard will, uh, will be the case. At his speech during, peak during World War, Second World War, the Irish Defence Forces had approximately 42,000 serving personnel. Over the course of the war, it is estimated that over 7,000 members of the Defence Forces deserted, many to join with uh, the Allied forces. Of these, some 2,500 personnel returned to the units where they were apprehended and were tried by military tribunal. The remaining personnel, numbering some 5,000, were the subject of dismissal under the Emergency Powers No. 362, Order 1945 of the Defence Forces Temporary Provisions Act 1946. The Emergency Powers ordered Order 1945, which was signed by the then Taoiseach on the 8th of August 1945, provi provided for automatic dismissal from the Defence Forces of certain uh, uh, deserters and absentees without, absentees, absentees without leave. The order also provided for surrender of pay and allowances and a con condition that every person to whom the order applied should be disqualified for seven years from holding any office or employment remunerated from central fund. This was subsequently enacted by the Oireachtas in the Defence Forces Temporary Provisions Bill Act 1946. The effect of the order was to impose a significant hardship on many individuals and families and remove uh, them from the right to be tried for the offences of which they stood accused and to provide a defence against the alleged crime. Many of the individuals were shunned in their uh, communities and many never returned to Ireland. Indeed, it is understood that some of those who were subject uh, of the order had actually died in combat. The majority of the individual, inv individuals impacted by the order have now passed on, while those still alive are now in the twilight years uh, of their lives. It was against this backdrop that in June 2012, and following a detailed consideration of the issue, the Government concluded that the sacrifice and contribution of those who deserted from the Defence Forces in fight of Allied side to World War uh, should be recognised. While not undermining the requirement, requirements of military discipline or in any way condoning uh, uh, their desertion of the time of national emergency. In the context, the Government committed to issuing an apology for the manner in which those members of the Defence Forces who left to join uh, the Allied side during the period 1939 to 1945, 1945 were treated after uh, war by the State and to seek and provide a legal mechanism that will provide an uh, amnesty to those who absented themselves from the, our Defence Forces for that reason. If these individuals uh, that the legislation I am introducing here today, the Defence Forces Second World War Amnesty and Immunity Bill 2012 seeks to address. The ability of the Defence Forces to maintain the high standards demanded uh, for them, of them requires complete clarity with regard to exercise uh, of command authority, whether at home or abroad. In order to maintain standards and rise to the challenges of military environment and all of the associated tasks, it is important to uphold a chain of command that is clear and uh, unambiguous, uh, and ambiguous uh, at all times. Indeed, it is critical uh, to the maintenance of the unit cohesion and operational effectiveness. In that regard, it goes without saying that Defence Forces must retain the power to enforce discipline to its own unique code of discipline with the military justice system. Disciplinary uh, code must be efficient and effective at all above uh, else it is, must be fair uh, to the individual. In common with armies throughout the world, uh, desertion from the Irish Defence Forces is regarded as a very serious offence. It is the heart of the system of military discipline that when an individual takes the solemn oath, uh, oath at the of, commencement of his or her career that he or she can uh, decide to uh, just, uh, just to up and leave or fail to, uh, uh, to available to perform duties. And while this is a very uh, much the case today, it would especially have been the case at a time when the, when, at the World War when, uh, was at war and our troops were on standby to defend our country from invasion. 
Before elaborating on the bill, I think it is important that I put on the record of the House the fact that the Government recognises the value and importance of the state of essential service given by all those who served in the Defence Forces throughout the period of the Second World War. They performed a crucial duty for the state at a time of national emergency and enormous difficulty. The loyalty of the Defence Forces to the state is indispensable. It is essential to the national interest that members of the Defence Forces do not abandon their duties at any time, especially a time of crisis, and no responsible government could ever depart from this principle. So I believe it is important that we acknowledge that throughout the period of the Second World War, the vast majority of men choose to stay in the Defence Forces and serve their own country. Their members were engaged in important service in their country, and it is crucial uh, that nothing uh, if we do now in any uh, way diminishes or under undervalues their loyalty and the service given by them uh, to the state. Having said that, I believe it is accepted by most people today that the majority of those who deserted the Defence Forces during the Second World War and who went on to fight against uh, fascism uh, did not so out of a sense of idealism but a commitment to protect de democracies from tiny and total tenerism. Had there been a, a different outcome uh, through uh, the Second World War, there is no reason to believe that the state would have been immune to invasion. In seeking to address the question of uh, desertion during the Second World War, the government has already acknowledged that the war gave rise to circumstances that were uh, of grave and exceptional. Members of the Defence Forces left their posts at a time to join the Allied side in the fight against the Trinity, and uh, together with many thousands of other Irish men and women, these individuals played an important role in defending freedom and democracy. Those who fought on the Allied side also uh, contributed uh, to the protecting the state's sovereignty and independence and our democratic values. I think it will be accepted by all in this House that it is almost 74 years since the outbreak of the Second World War, our understanding of history has matured. History, teachers, history teacher, uh, teaches us lessons that sometimes can only be learned from uh, the benefit of hindsight. The actions of those taken long ago, for whatever reasons, are not beyond re-evaluation. These actions can uh, now be considered free from uh, the constraints that bound those directly involved at a time and without questioning or revisiting their motivations. As Minister Shatter stated and has previously said, the exploits of uh, men who left the Defence Forces to join the Allied Allies have been uh, politically airbrushed out of uh, contemporary history. But at this time of greater insight and understanding of the shared history and experiences of Ireland and Britain, I believe it is time is right for the role played by those brave volunteer Irish veterans to be recognised and the re rejection they experienced uh, understood. From the remove, from the remove of uh, 2013, it is very hard to imagine the difficult decisions that people made when they uh, consciously decided to leave Ireland to join with the Allied forces during the course of the Second World War. Of course, during that period, Ireland decided to remain neutral, but I think it is safe to say that at the time of anti-British feeling was still running very high. Despite the high level of anti-British feeling and without doubt, exist, uh, without doubt existed over the period of the Second World War, an estimated 60,000 individually motivated citizens from 26 counties left these shores to serve as volunteers in the British Armed Forces. While at the end of the war, many of those who did choose to fight with the Allies uh, stayed on and sought to build lives for themselves, many more did return to Ireland. There is no doubt that many veterans returning to Ireland at the end of the Second World War were met with uh, grudging uh, acceptance. However, it is also clear that others faced hostility. This, this was particularly true uh, when the individuals, individual was known to have deserted the Defence Forces. For all of them, the honour and celebration which they have been experienced at the end of, uh, end of war in England contrasted sh sharply with the changed circumstances on, of their return. There was no flag waving or cheering masses to greet them here. 
Instead, they were faced with difficulties in seeking either work or social assistance, and indeed many of their countrymen and women remain suspicious towards these individuals long after their return. Before moving into the detailed and specific provisions of the bill, I think it is important that, just as Minister Shatter did during the second stage debate in Shannon Aaron, I re-emphasise that government does not condone a desertion and fully recognises values and respects the contribution of all those who stood by their post with the Defence Forces and pledged their lives to defend this state, this state's integrity and sovereignty against any of all the aggressors. In, in any consideration of the matter, we must also bear in mind the principle that these decisions cannot be left to the individual desertion of individual soldiers on active service, and also soldiers must accept that there are consequences uh, for desertion. Provi the provisions of the bill, I will now move on to the specific pr pr provisions of the bill. Section 1 outlines the definitions uh, for the purpose of the bill. Section 2 provides for an amnesty uh, for members of the Defence Forces who deserted, uh, who were absent without leave during the course of the Second World War and who subsequently served with forces fighting on the Allied side and in that war and who uh, were dismissed uh, from the Defence Forces by the emergency powers of 1945. Uh, B were convicted of desertion, um, of being absent without leave, or were uh, liable to be uh, prosecuted for desertion or being absent without leave. Deputies will have noticed that the bill provides for amnesty for those uh, convicted of uh, desertion or being absent without leave rather than a pardon uh, as was originally envisaged by the government. This change ha has been made for technical reasons and is in line with legal advice provided to me during the drafting uh, of the process by the uh, Attorney General and to, to the effect that pardon would require that each case be individually processed, a situation that would clearly uh, not be possible uh, for practi in practical uh, terms. Section 3 provides an immunity for prose prosecution for members of the Defence Forces who deserted or were absent without leave during the course of the Second World War and who subsequently served uh, forces fighting on the Allied side in that war. Section 4 provides that no right, liability or any cause of action shall arise resulting from enactment. Section 4 also provides that the amnesty being provided in Section 2 will not have the effect of a pardon under Article 13.6 of the Constitution. Section 5 provides for the short title of the bill. I am satisfied uh, that the bill was drafted fully meets the government's commitment to deal in a positive way with the issue of those who deserted our defence forces to join the Allied forces during the course of the Second World War. And it does so in a way that does uh, not expose the state to any liability, uh, any liability in respect of those individuals. I also believe that the bill that uh, if this bill is enacted, it will send an important message to those uh, surviving members and relatives of those who have since passed away. That message uh, you can be proud of your contribution, uh, of your relatives uh, contribution in the fight for freedom. Indeed it is more uh, than that. As we look at uh, the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of uh, the commencement of the Great War and the 75th anniversary of the World War II in 2014, and the remembrance of all those who served and who died in these conflicts, those surviving or the relatives of those who have since passed on can proudly commemorate the sacrifices they made during the very difficult time, not only in Irish history, but the history of the Europe and the wider world. I am very pleased to submit, submit this legislation uh, for consideration of the House, and I look forward uh, and with anticipation of hearing the views and contributions of all deputies uh, in both government and opposition uh, in their deliberation and reflections on this bill. I commend the bill to Dáleán. Good morning, I now call Good morning, I will ask you to 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 Sucht an 
Bill Dreachta Kahanoa, who will cutter me at town, the school on spirit chart or Lero on now not a or the organ cast. So Chanet couple shot on a hen, Lerg and Chanador Pascal of Moenic, Mach Fiona Foyle Pakulesh, Gustamishus Oster Raw and Shock, Machil and Fibagan, Lesh and Villa, Gemak Fiona Foyle at Takulesh reached. Uh, on Shaw, because Falchia must talk about special to Riv and Balch in a Luisha or Law Shaw, girl, you know, it's is, is rud, is rud on a diary, a side you're a day, Arama Shake, Agus Shinatai Geshtagan and Shaw, Ak Linda Blaine to Tommy here on Kugamur, you know, Tommy Trish, Iri Nisabi, Tommy Fast Sous. Stoke of Marsta took us as Federig Jacker Jacker Harnash or Mahaktri P. Ufasaka Horlig and Amshin Agus Stoke of Mion de Frul the Hagen. So Faltium Riven and Fierik Gur Mahunus at Hagest, St. Billa Shaw, in honor to Pardo and Ginnerata, Femer at Hache, like a Shias Savunracht. Naskion Korla, it is good to have the opportunity to address an issue of this uh, importance here uh, in the House this evening. And I think it is important that in addressing the issue of those uh, soldiers who deserted uh, to support the Allied war effort, that we not lose sight of uh, all those other Irish men and women who left these shores. It's estimated maybe 60,000 from the 26 counties and maybe upwards of another 60,000 from uh, the, the six counties to participate. Uh, in the effort against what was a fundamentally evil uh, regime. Uh, and we all accept, I think, that those who participated in the battle against uh, Hitler's, Hitler's monstrous regime were uh, fighting, in the interests, fighting in the interests of humanity as, as we know it. And I suppose as we meet today and dis discuss these uh, issues, we remember in particular those people who lost their lives. Um, I come from County Kildare, like Deputy Daly behind me. We have a particularly strong uh, tradition of support and respect for uh, the Defence Forces, and it goes back to beyond the foundation of the state, because within our county were uh, based many, many members of the British Armed Forces for many years. So. Our, our tradition in Kildare is strong and our respect is strong. And, you know, I was interested in just looking at this issue uh, in the past at um, writings of one of our very well respected solicitors and historians in Kildare, uh, Frank Taff, who has addressed this issue of the number of Kildare people uh, who had family members uh, or, or con connections who um, took part in this particular. Uh, war and I read into the record of the house uh, an extract from one of his writings, uh, Eye on the Past, and he says he's talking here about uh, reading a book uh, about the uh, personnel that had deserted and those who had participated in the war effort. And he, he, he says, and I quote, I went through the book at a time and extracted the names of 19 Athai men uh, from the town and the surrounding countryside were included in what was sometimes referred to as the list, the Irish list of shame. For my part, I never regarded the book in that light, and especially so after I had the privilege of interviewing one of the men who was so listed. His story was a simple one. Without work and with no prospect of getting work, he enlisted in the Irish army, only to find conditions and food so bad as to be intolerable. He, in company with so many of his army colleagues, traveled by train to Belfast to enlist in the British Armed Forces. He was not, his was not an, an ordinary act of desertion, rather a simple man's response to what he felt was an uncaring Irish army uh, regime which treated its recruits with callous disregard for their well-being. He fought alongside Irish men, English men, Scotsmen and Welshmen throughout the Second World War and never once did anyone question uh, his right to do so." End of quote. I was struck as well in looking at some of the statistics around this particular issue um, that the first RAF bomber pilot 
shot down and killed in 1939 uh, was uh, Willie Murphy from Cork. And his navigator, Les Count Corley, a Larry Slattery from Thurlis, became the, the longest serving prisoner of war. And the co pilot of the last RAF bomber uh, to be shot down over Germany and killed in May uh, 1945, as the horror came to an end, was an Irishman by the name of Sergeant William Mackay. And in common, as I said, with many Irish families, I had my own experience where my only aunt and godmother. Uh, went to London in the early 1940s, met a young man who had grown up and uh, been educated in Dublin and who had left the country for economic reasons and who then joined the Irish Guards, as many, many Irish people subsequently did. And he went on to be shot down over uh, Tunisia and is buried with many of his Irish comrades uh, in, in Tunis. So this is a topic, uh, I would say, that resonates with people up and down the, the country. Uh, and I think all of them, those who were directly connected to those who simply participated as volunteers and those who were connected to those people who, for whatever reason, uh, deserted, are, are welcoming of the fact that your government and this House uh, is today debating this particular issue and is debating it in a positive and, I hope, uh, constructive way. I'm interested also, when we talk around those statistics of six to 7,000 uh, people who left the Defence Forces, when they were at an incredible strength of 42,000, and if I read the, the records correctly, between 39 and um, 45, the strength of our force was ranged between 40,000 and 60,000 at any one given time. But Professor Michael Kennedy from the Royal Irish Academy raises the point that we, we know that perhaps 5,000 of those deserters went on to uh, join the armed forces, but we don't know exactly what became um, of the, uh, the rest of them and whether they became involved in the, the war effort in Britain or not. Um, now, the Minister has highlighted the impact of uh, the, the pr procedures that were in place at the time, and he, he talks about those who were dismissed were disqualified from seven years from any public or civil service employment, including employment with local authorities or positions on any board or office of semi-state companies, and they would have had no pension entitlements from the day in which they absconded and no entitlement to receive employment assistance. And I suppose when we look back now, there were pretty genuine reasons for the harsh nature of the uh, imposition of penalties at that time. The government of the day decided to punish desertion in this way rather than in the traditional military fashion with court martials because of the scale of the, of the desertion. It would have been impossible logistically, I think, to uh, court martial 500 deserters. It certainly wasn't practical. And at the time, according to the Minister for Defence, Oscar Traynor, in 1946, he said it, it was not deemed feasible to hold court martials on the large number, even if they could be apprehended. And a question would arise as to whether they could be apprehended or be apprehended for a, a long period of years. The Minister at the time also held that court martials would also have resulted in more serious punishments for deserters. If these men, he said, had been tried by court martial and dealt with through the medium of courts martial, many of them would have received very severe sentences. And as to the exclusion from state employment, the minister in 46 was giving preference to those who had not deserted. Whatever number of vacancies ex exist will be held, he said, for the men who served this nation loyally. The decision was strongly criticised by the opposition parties who felt that desertion should have been dealt with in the traditional manner. So the opposition parties on this occasion are certainly a hell of a lot more mild-mannered in uh, our approach. Um, I think it's also important to put the context of all of this, uh, to, to refer to the context of all of this, uh, and it's viewed very often uh, with the benefit of hindsight in the context of Irish neutrality, British-Irish relations, and not often enough, I think, viewed uh, in the context of the, the human relations that would have existed between citizens uh, in this state of ours, citizens in Britain, uh, Scotland, England and, and, and Wales. But um, we're talking about a situation and initiatives that were taken uh, by a fledgling state, a state very anxious to demonstrate to its neighbours and to the world that it was an independent state, proud of that sovereignty that it had recently won 
and determined to protect uh, that so sovereignty. Uh, it was also a policy which, here in the country at the time, had widespread public support. And remember, we weren't the only country uh, who uh, didn't rush to the war effort. Remember uh, that the uh, American government, uh, despite pleas for their support and participation, only uh, became involved after uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, so I, I think that context for what happened is very important and it's something that we uh, need not uh, lose sight of. The emergency years in Ireland were extremely difficult uh, years for the public at large. Uh, sustaining a defence force here to be, in order to be enabled to respond to any eventuality of between 50, 40 and 60,000 people was a real challenge for the government of the day uh, and was a cost, it has to be said, on the taxpayer of the time. So while obviously the state did not suffer the horrors of war, uh, it was still a time of crisis, rationing uh, and privation for many of our citizens. And allowing desertion to go unpunished was simply not an option for the government in 1945. And while one brutal war may have ended, who is to say that another would not have broken out? The Cold War was about to start and the, the circumstances no government could do anything other but to impose the most stringent penalties on deserters. But I think in the more enlightened period and the peaceful period uh, that we now are privileged to uh, enjoy, that we can look back with greater compassion, greater understanding, uh, we can uh, empathise uh, with those people who, for whatever reason, uh, felt the need to leave the Irish Defence Forces, some of them, I'm sure, motivated by the highest of ideals, uh, others perhaps not, others uh, seeing an opportunity to uh, get out of a country that was under extreme economic pressure at the time, as indeed we are, I suppose, today. But I think it is appropriate, Minister, that the bill you've been brought forward, that you've brought forward, uh, that it would get the support of all parties in this House, uh, that we would uh, enact it as soon as possible, uh, and that we say to those very few survivors of that very turbulent period that uh, these houses of the Oireachtas uh, respect the contribution that they made to the cause uh, of, um, to the Allied cause. Uh, to the war against a, 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 a brutal and monstrous uh, regime uh, and that we do, albeit belatedly, belatedly uh, thank them and congratulate them on what they did and that where their motives were right, we are happy and content uh, as a parliament to extend uh, an amnesty to them. Uh, I'm not sure of what particular practical benefit that will be to any of those remaining uh, people affected, but at least no more so than with the Taoiseach's apology some weeks ago to the uh, Magdalen uh, Laundry women. It has a very important uh, symbolic uh, effect, I think, on all those uh, involved. So, with those few thoughts, um, I too uh, commend the legislation to the House. And I thank you, Lascan Corda, for the opportunity of having contributed. Um, Better go heal she like an arm, Magus. In a year, Gorowder, a Denavan cart, uh, Oct of Rishi, Nodden Damad, and Gallunt, done start. August dog she didn't start, and he's Uskulta, the Unra, O Hitler, Agus Aram. No few Unra, O Imperat, Nebratna, a V Fos, a Kav Sul, a Dro, on Sayer start, Egan start shin. It's Lair of O Ain Tishkin, no Ain Stodder, and Star. Rev Carter and Da have the cost show. On start, I guess a force of V New Nodrock, I guess you to be a Geary, Shas of a Glock, a Gwena on Tolk, I guess on Tolk's a cost show, no Hitler, I guess you the Hog Tokyo. 
Peter Gulcher Yart, as the blame to Emma Hart, go Doctor Ahantas Dolph Shoot, Reagan Ford, Tri Mahonus of Ron Orha, Agus on on real on our mugs and start the cliche. I guess mass mass of Gulcher Shing Hart, I guess then I dial all that needs more. Many Irish citizens joined the British forces to fight during the Second World War, as they had done in many imperial wars uh, in the past. Many joined uh, because it was a tradition in their families. Some joined for adventure, others joined out of loyalty or affinity to the British state, and others joined for the purpose of fighting a greater evil than the British Empire itself. A great number of Irish men uh, died in battles during the Second World War, and their sacrifice is now uh, a matter of a regularised annual commemoration in the state, and, and as rightly so. Regretfully, though, also, there are some who died on the access side, um, and, and kind of their, their memory uh, is, is, in many ways, besmirched by the fact that they fought on that side. Today, we are addressing, though, the issues surrounding those who deserted the state's defence forces 60 years ago to join another army uh, to fight Nazism, to fight Hitler's army in Europe. And given the, la the lapse of time, it is impractical to revisit the individual circumstances surrounding each case, and many of those who survived the war are now deceased, and the amnesty in this legislation has been deemed to be the most appropriate means to acknowledge that those men deserted to do a greater good, and that their insubordination and their perceived treasonous act to fight an evil threatening the very fabric of democracy and society and the world was not a wrong as perceived at the time, uh, and that an amnesty would also bring this matter to a close. The amnesty is, if you want, a redress uh, measure. While we're on the subject of redress measures, uh, this state, I would like to remind the Minister of the responsibility of the government to apologise, for instance, to those who are survivors of symphysiotomy, or, for instance, the survivors of the Bethany Homes uh, in, in, in this state who were left out of any attempt to make amends when we were dealt with the Magdalen women only last week. Uh, the, the children of those deserted uh, the, in this case were promptly taken uh, by the cruelty men and put into forced labour in industrial schools and the Magdalen laundry for their so-called crimes against their father. But hopefully we will come back to that. That's not the issue today, but it is an issue that needs redress. It needs to be taken on board. And the state, uh, thankfully, in recent years, has accepted its responsibility to make uh, an apology for their past mistakes. And I'll come back to other, other ones and past wrongs. Kind of, and I think in society today, we are big enough uh, and strong enough as a society to admit that there were failings in this state and that uh, for all of us that we have failings in our life. And I think that's a sign of a mature society and hopefully uh, the, the, the wrongs that I've mentioned will be addressed. Like Phil Aaron Bill Ari, Sinn Féin approves of this bill as a recognition of the response to the actions of deserters at the time. The deserters were faced with the Emergency Powers No. 362 Order 1940 uh, and summary dismissal and were punitively prevented from gaining employment from the state having been dishonourably discharged after absconding. Bizarrely, though, uh, while they were barred from state employment on returning, it was also uh, important to note that the state made administrative provi provisions so that they could receive pension entitlements from the British authorities. So on the one hand, yes, it's fine, you can get your British entitlement from your service in the war, but we're not going to give you a, 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 any, uh, a, a, any job or any, any recognition in any shape or form. I must also note that I also understand the concerns of the current uh, serving members in the Defence Force and some who, who, who served at the time and since uh, that they have with this bill because it is totally understandable that when they are faced with the level of cutbacks currently ongoing within the Defence Force and their continuing downsizing and downgrading that this must feel like a, a kick in the teeth for them to see an amnesty granted to those who in fact up sticks and left at a time of the state's greatest needs. Uh, because Ireland, despite being neutral, also faced the threat of invasion, not just from the Nazis, but remember that the British also drew up a plan to invade and to conquer or reconquer Ireland at the time. And that mustn't be forgotten, because that, in fact, uh, uh, at the time, that Ireland, uh, uh, the Irish state, the full Irish state, 
uh, uh, had a foreign army, well, sorry, two foreign armies stationed on Irish soil. The British and the US Army were based for the duration of the war in the six counties in large numbers in preparation for D-Day, but also afterwards. It is in that context that it is important, though, to recognise that those who remained in Ireland and served the Irish Defence Forces throughout the Second World War and acknowledge the service that they gave uh, and the fact that they didn't abandon their duties. Although, as an Irish Republican, uh, I wish some of them had abandoned their duties because then many of those who were imprisoned by the state mightn't have served their time uh, in the internment camp in the Curra, and some of those who were executed by the state might have been uh, free to live a, 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 a longer life. Um, but kind of we, 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 uh, I will return to that and maybe the state will, will, will look again at that point. The fundamental point of this bill is to say at the time it was not, it's not feasible for the government to have gone through the normal channels of military justice which would have entailed rounding up, court-martialing and imprisoning almost 5,000 men. Well, that's what's said. But remember, most of those who uh, deserted were quickly away out of the country and already in various armies. And we're not talking just about the British Army here because people served also in the US and the Canadian Army and other armies on the Allied side. Um, so the, the deserters weren't even missed sometimes, so it was, would have been impractical anyway for, for, for the Army to look at rounding them up. Um, I'm not aware of any Defence Forces deserter who ended up fighting on the access side, uh, so that's a, that's a good thing. But there were others of many hues, uh, and some representing the state who besmirched their reputation and Ireland's reputation uh, by aligning themselves with Hitler's grand plans and in some cases uh, collaborated with them with their genocidal policies. Uh, returning to the questions of the court-martials, uh, the Fidefoil administration at the time were easily able to summon those court-martials when it suited them, especially to intern and to convict, and uh, including execution Republicans during that period of the emergency. The, the state was so distracted in rounding up Republicans that it couldn't have uh, gone and rounded up all of these deserted if they had stayed in the state. And the Curragh was already at overcapacity as internees were imprisoned for years on end and that it couldn't and wouldn't, that the state wouldn't pursue the deserters because it, it, its main target were Republicans at the time. Also remember that there was a, a period, uh, during that period, a nod of a wink support for the Allied forces by the state with captured British airmen, etc., finding their way north conveniently, even though they'd been captured. Uh, and there was an exchange of information uh, which, which had been gleaned by the likes of uh, G2 uh, and the Garda Special Branch, which was past the civil servants, which conveniently or mysteriously found its way into British hands. Just as I would commend those who went and fought to prevent the spread of fascism, especially those who joined armies other than the British Army, which was occupying an uh, occupying force in Ireland, I would commend those who also left Ireland and fought against fascism during the Spanish Civil War. And don't forget that this was at a time when Nazi Germany was supplying uh, General Franco in Spain the hardware to bomb towns and cities such as Guernica and to gun down many brave Spanish and their international comrades on the plains of battlefronts uh, across the, 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 the Spanish state. I wonder when the state, or the church in, in particular, will ever apologise to the volunteers and their families who had to sneak out of this country to fight the evils of fascism, which they understood three years before the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, and the dangers of Franco's uh, dictatorship and the shared ideas he and Hitler had, and others within Europe, uh, and uh, what they shared at this time. Remember, those volunteers were excommunicated, ostracised and discriminated against by this church and by elements in the state because they had the gall and the bravery to stand for the greater good of society and against the evils of fascism, uh, whether it was in Ireland or in Europe. They su suffered the same retribution Irish Republicans and their families suffered after the civil war in Ireland, the torture, the imprisonment and the executions, and also the ostracisation, exile, discrimination, being pilloried and the censure of Republicans during the founding uh, time of this state and the civil war and, slight, uh, and for a number of years afterwards. It is interesting that it is Fine Gael and the Fine Gael Minister who has brought this bill forward to acknowledge that the state wronged those people who were fighting fascists given their own blue shirt history because Minister your party was 
emerge right off the blue shorts, the Army Comrades Association, the National Guard, the Common and Ale, the National Centre Party, and in fact, Southern Unionists. Not that their founding organisation uh, of the Blue Shirt gave any good account of themselves uh, when they were fighting fascism in Spain, because they spent most of their time cowering in the trenches, or when ordered from the front by Franco, they were cowering in the, the wine bars before being sent home in disgrace. No apologies, though, from Fine Gael for the wrongs done on them or their families. Where is the amnesty or the pardon to the members of the Defence Forces as well, who mistakenly joined the Free State Forces thinking it would stand by the Republic and then left, having f seen sense, and joined uh, the, the IRA during the Civil War. There's no apology and there's never been an apology and a recognition of that. When Phila er an prave cash to ta, like then if Tinnis doing in you, ta se tavuktuk, nak vil daut er bi oring, madar le star an dara kuga down the. And the Minister has spoken about uh, the, the the state's neutrality position during the war as a principle of moral bankruptcy in the context of the Holocaust. And kind of that is a debate that we can have outside this chamber uh, in, in academia and elsewhere, um, but I, I don't believe he, he is correct. Um, it is not the, the Holocaust that motivated the Allied powers uh, to, to come together. It was motivated by a wish to defeat the Axis powers. In fact, the USSR and the US both remained neutral until they were attacked themselves. It wasn't because of the Holocaust that they joined together. And regardless of your, your, your views on the rights or wrongs of these positions, that is uh, what they were. Perhaps amongst the 5,000 deserters, and there are also questions exactly whether that's the exact figure, maybe there was more, uh, maybe there was, there, was, there, 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 there was substantially less. There are many who were ideologically motivated to leave the country's defence forces and defect to the fight the Nazis. But ideologically motivated or not, we should not misread the motivations of the Allied side in the early years of the war. This is not to deny in any way the right and the need to commemorate their memories and what they were fighting against uh, for, for the full duration and the full context of, of, of the war. Those who returned uh, from that war were effectively blacklisted from employment and this consigned many of them to poverty and that was wrong. And this state should have addressed that discrimination years ago and, often, uh, and, the, and, and the consequential poverty that they and their families had to endure. And it's good that it, that is happening here today. The emergency powers order denied them the opportunity to defend themselves and their actions. However, given that such time has passed, it is completely impractical to visit each and every case of desertion and much more appropriate, I think, therefore, that we proceed with this bill. We should not be uh, surprised either, though, of, of uh, how the de Valera government responded at the time. Because don't forget, at the, uh, uh, at the time, in relation to Republicans, they had interned over 2,000 people in the Corps, 2,000 people during the period which they called the emergency, and they had scant regard for anyone's rights when they were held in there. The government were absolutely brutal in its use of the special powers at the time. They broke these men, and many of the men were so distressed by the inhumane inhuman conditions uh, that they were forced to live in and that they simply could not function in a normal society once they were released. And that is a legacy uh, that uh, we, 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 as a society, also live with. These prisoners, three of them died on hunger strike against uh, their imprisonment and against those conditions they were held in. Jack McNeilia, Tony Darcy and Sean McCaughey all died protesting the conditions in the Corrigue prison camps. During Sean McCaughey's inquest, it was made known that he had been outside. He had not been outside in the fresh air or the sunlight for four and a half years, having been kept in for months on end in solitary confinement. Sean McBride, at the time, acting as counsel for the next of kin during the inquest, asked, if he, if he, asked the doctor if he would keep a dog in such condition, and the, doctor, uh, the prison doctor said he would not, but it happened. This is in stark contrast to how certain categories of prisoners were treated in the Kura. These were soldiers from the Allied uh, and Axis powers who found themselves in Ireland during the Second World War and ended up in the Kura prison camps. They were 
they were held as prisoners of war, uh, uh, and in, in comparison, they were wined and dined, if you want. But in, in, in some cases, they were, it went even beyond that, because uh, some of those soldiers were, the, the British soldiers were allowed to attend social functions outside uh, the, the camp. Uh, some of them even had their own bicycles and were allowed to travel to Dublin uh, for events under supervision. That's how bizarre it was. Uh, uh, kind of that right wasn't allowed to people who weren't convicted, who weren't combatants uh, in, in the war, which, which was, well, the, they were a risk to the state because there were British soldiers in, in, in uniform when they landed, and they should have been considered a risk to the state. But it is a far cry from the fate that befell the Republicans in the Curragh, uh, which, which was being run under de Valera's regime, uh, because they were being kept, as I said, in, in solitary confinement. The authorities of the day also were no strangers to coming down hard on Republicans, and despite interventions from everyone from Sean McBride, Oliver J. Flanagan, and members of the Labour Party, de Valera's gov government, in fact, contracted the infam infamous British executioner, Albert Pierpoint, to hang Charlie Cairns. Cairns had joined the IRA after the government used the pretext of the emergency to up the ante against and to come down more harshly on Republicans. And that re resulted in unspeakable cruelty. On what, what no, that's, this is the truth. See, the truth hurts, Minister. So, Cairns was found guilty, but guilty by a non-jury military tribunal, the ones that they couldn't supposedly set up to capture all of these deserters. They, it, 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 he, 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 he was also... Okay. He, 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 sorry, Minister. No, the the uh, truth hurts. If you can't Deputy take it, you might as well leave the chamber. But, if you listen for a minute. Yeah, okay. When you're all need a big minute to be careful. When you're all need a big minute to be careful, Chief McCampbell, will you? 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 Will on the radio and in the papers in order to prevent any groundswell of support. Or what about the mention of George Plant, an IRA volunteer, and a Protestant for that matter from, from down your own end of the country, Minister. Uh, he was a volunteer from the 1920s period who was dubiously tried and sentenced to death in relation to the capture and interrogation of an, uh, of an, uh, an, an informer. The uh, informer in fact happened to be an IRA chief of staff, uh, Sean Hayes. Or, for instance, the execution within weeks of arrest of volunteers Patrick McGrath and T Tommy Hart again refused a uh, right to appeal. Or volunteers Morris O'Neill or Richard Gough. Or, for instance, the shooting dead in captivity in the Curragh of Bernard Casey. The Minister said that this, and may say that this is not, for instance, the day for discussing these particular aspects of the state's wrongdoing. But if we are to embark on a journey of healing wounds that the state inflicted in the past, then it is something that must be addressed by everyone. And in fact, the state mightn't have such a schizophrenic approach to Irish re reunification to its history and to the outworkings of that history uh, to its past if it faced up to it. If it had the truth and reconciliation process that, in fact, we're suggesting now for the period of the last 30 years or so, if it had that at any stage since the 1920s, and it can still happen even at this late stage, and we might see a merger, as we've seen, kind of between the blue shirts and Cumann and Gael and all of those, you might see a merger back again between Fianna Fáil and, uh, and Fianna Gael, and even Sinn Féin thrown in for that matter, because we all came from, 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 from the one party in one ways, but we have gone our, our up. But it might be appropriate that we... It, it may be appropriate, though, it may be appropriate that we face into the centenary commemorations around the revolutionary period of 1916 to 21 and the counter-revolutionary period afterwards, because there are many long conversations that need to be held regarding the actions of past governments and elements of the architect of the state that we should have a discussion, including the discussion around what happened in Ireland during the Second World War. In all of this, we need to heed lessons from history and not repeat them, and we need to be mindful and vigilant, especially in this era of recession, of those who resort to racism and anti-Semitism. 
There are some in political life in Europe and beyond who hold similar views to those which led to the slaughter of the Holocaust and to the Second World War itself. And we must not be complacent when it comes to the prospect of fascism. Because Greece does not have and didn't have a history of fascism, but Greek fascists didn't fall from the sky. They violently, the violently aggressive uh, program of impoverishing a nation at the behest of the Troika, the victimization of its people, and the pitting of citizens against one another is fertile grounds for fascism. Look at the Golden Dawn recently in those elections in Greece who gained 7% and whose members openly gave Nazi salutes and advocate fascist ideologies. They scapegoat in immigrants and even threaten, at one case, to remove immigrants who are in hospital from those hospitals who, uh, th that were low on, on drugs. Golden Dawn appeared in Greece because racist ideas were allowed to fester in the public mindset in combination with the social dislocation and economic devastation. We need to be mindful of that, not only in Ireland, but throughout Europe. Thankfully, it appears that far right in this state are confined to the rooms of lonely men who lurk on the far right internet message Board, posting racist comments and sad cases who think they can impress people with spray paint and racist graffiti. But the governments inadvertently fuel extremist right-wing ideology by certain actions. And I would urge caution, especially given the fact that elected councillors have freely called, and we heard it last night on the television, for apartheid uh, for travellers. And even in the past, we had a Minister for Justice here uh, who, who, who was uh, alleged to have made racist comments during the referendum, the citizenship referendum. And you have your own Minister, Phil Hogan, and some judges who have also strayed very close to racist comments when it comes to travellers. And we need to be very mindful uh, 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 and careful about our language, otherwise you're fueling into uh, uh, an element there, and an element which uh, would, in, in, in the past, given rise to fascism. We, I know I'm not making an allegation in, uh, against anybody in this House, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm just urging caution because there are people out there who will feed on that type of, uh, of, of, of language. And we, 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 we have heard it in recent times, especially in relation to traveller. It doesn't take much for fascist or racist groups to gain a foothold when people are neglected and left weary from economic dis de destruction and the massive, massive levels of unemployment. Even, for instance, Nick Griffin in, in Britain managed to get himself elected to the European Parliament. There are di dangerous ideologies, uh, and Greece certainly will not be the last uh, European country to witness the, the rise or a rise of a degree of fascism unless we address it early, some, so, something which Europe hadn't done and didn't succeed to do in the 1930s when the dangers were, were clear to every, uh, everyone who was willing to listen, uh, especially when the rest of Europe didn't support those uh, uh, who stood by the Republic in Spain in 1936 uh, uh, and before that. While we are examining issues of the past and making right the wrongs of the past, it is essential that we bear in mind that we do not uh, impact on the future of, of the Republic while we're still in, uh, uh, attempting to create it. So I, 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 I think that is an important debate and I think today this bill is an important part and I, I think it, it, it is believed that maybe as many of uh, the, the 5,000 men deserted the Irish Defence Forces, a hundred of them, I think, are, are still living, and hopefully this bill will give them some type of solace uh, uh, and that, the, the, that they will uh, respect uh, the, the amnesty that they're being given in relation to their ac actions. But what they are also owed is to live out their days in this country uh, in, in, in conditions that to, that they know that the conditions are not there to feed into to fascism and that it will not be allowed to breed. And that they will never have to see those forces that they fought against uh, during the Second World War ever come to the fore. So my party and I will be supporting this bill in, in the Dáil as we did in the Shannon, uh, and as I said, I welcome it. It is a way of addressing it, and hopefully it, it is a signal of addressing uh, many other of the wrongs of this state, and that we will have uh, fu fu future discussions in and around the issues that I raised. For Margaret. Now the next speaking slot is shared by Deputy Clare Daly and Finian McGrath. Deputy Daly. <laughs> Thanks, Ciarán Coyle. We'll but try and get it in before, you have six minutes anyway. before the break. OK, listen, um, you know, I suppose I'm speaking here as somebody who has a family that goes back to the foundation of the Irish Army, but also somebody who is uh, an internationalist and a socialist. And in that context, 
uh, very clear on the understanding that it's ordinary, always ordinary people and ordinary soldiers who pay the price in any war. And I think the Second World War was no different. We all know the stories of the promises of freedoms and homes fit for heroes and people ending up uh, being sent back, heroes only fit for homes, with all the scars that go uh, with war. And I think the issue here before us really is not just how these men were treated at the time, but also the long delay in the Irish state recognising it and dealing with uh, this issue, which I think is a feature really of a lack of political backbone and is also linked to our relationship with uh, Britain. It is a fact that the British government, seven years after the ending of the Second World War, uh, announced an amnesty for 10,000 of its members who were involved in desertion at, at uh, that time and obviously this was an army that was actively involved in uh, the combat. Here we are 60 years later still deliberating on uh, what to do about it and I do think we have to approach the issue with a, a sense of history absolutely but also a sense of, of perspective and uh, humanity and I do believe that one of the reasons why we've delayed on this and that there was such punitive measures imposed on army deserters in these circumstances was that it wasn't just about punishing uh, the men for desertion but it was equally about where they deserted to and to me that's the only explanation for why this issue hasn't been addressed before now it's because they deserted and ended up uh, joining the uh, British Army and in that sense I think the issue has been surrounded by a certain amount of anglophobia that has existed really since the foundation of the state to me it is a legacy of the Hippocrat hypocritical uh, relationship and attitude that the weak Irish state has had in its dealings with uh, Britain where years ago clearly obviously uh, the battle was fought for independence uh, against Britain but as James Connolly warned at the time that if you could remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic then your efforts will be in vain England will still rule you she would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her usurers, through the whole array of commercialist and individual institutions she has planted in this country. Nationalism without socialism, without a reorganisation of society uh, on the basis of a broader, more developed form of co common property is the only national necessity. And I think because since the foundation of the state, we have continued to treat our citizens so poorly and not grant them economic uh, independence that many of these issues arise. We're quite happy to export nurses now that we train in our hospitals to get jobs in Britain. We're quite happy to export Irish women from this country to legally say they have the right to travel, to look after their health, to go to Britain for an abortion, but they can't have an abortion within their own country. And I think it was the failure to deal with the economic independence of many of the people who originally joined the Irish army and then in desperation ended up having to desert and go to Britain. And that the key reason for me uh, examining the history books weren't ideological reasons in fact but economic reasons because a family and a soldier was expected to bring up his family on 14 shillings uh, during that war that was simply not enough to uh, uh, keep a family together and I think the question we have to ask ourselves is is poverty treason I'm quite sure that many of these people grappled hard, that it wasn't an easy decision. They knew that they would be vilified. They knew that there would be difficult um, decisions made to them, but clearly they felt they had no choice but to look after their families to take uh, that step uh, forward. And I think the way in which they were treated was uh, very shabby, was unacceptable, and I I'm glad that the issue is being tidied up uh, at the moment. I note the points made by the Minister uh, in relation to the fact almost, well, it was almost posed by some of the speakers that the lack of access to the military courts was kind of doing them a favour uh, and that the emergency powers were kind of done to help them. I don't buy that argument. The emergency powers were always dodgy. They were always wrong. It was a starvation order which denied these men entitlements, gratuities, barred them from working in public and, and government jobs for seven years, disqualified them from unemployment benefits in Ireland and so on. And I think that
that was wrong. And I think actually one of the reasons why military tribunals weren't utilised is because of the time, it's because of the media attention that would have been put on this issue. And let's remember that de Valera at that time had already embarrassed the country, thrown the international eye onto Ireland by officially commiserating with the German government on the death of Hitler. So clearly there was, if you like, another motive here in not bringing this issue to the attention, not being seen to deal with uh, the deserters who joined the Irish army and not wanting to uh, put media attention on this. I, I have very little time now, but emigration to Britain is continuing now. We're exporting our people because this country is failing to, to provide them with a decent standard of living. Our front life service providers, we see Irish firemen operating in New York, we see Irish nurses in uh, 